Cellular respiration is how just about every living creature extracts energy out of the food that we eat. You might have already learned that we consume foods in the form of three macromolecules, carbohydrates, protein, and fat. They all provide energy, but not in the exact form that our cells require. So within our cells we have organelles called mitochondria that convert the carbs, protein, and fat that we eat into an energy molecule that is usable by our cells. And this mighty molecule made in the mitochondria is called ATP. So cellular respiration is the production of ATP in the mitochondria and it's got a, an electron transport chain similar to what we saw in the thylakoid where you get a buildup of protons on one side of the membrane in order that the protons may power ATP synthase as they flow back to the other side of the membrane. Cellular respiration is sometimes referred to as oxidative phosphorylation because the phosphorylation of ADP to make ATP is driven by the oxidative power of oxygen, unlike photophosphorylation in photosynthesis, which is driven by the power of photons, light energy. Photosynthesis is a way for plants to store energy in the form of starch. Cellular respiration is a way for our cells to extract that stored energy. So as you would expect, the chemical equation is the reverse of photosynthesis, except that the energy going into photosynthesis is light energy and the energy coming out of cellular respiration is chemical energy in the form of ATP. In the photosynthesis equation, I had a lightning bolt representing an input of light energy into the equation, but we'll have an output of energy in cellular respiration, so instead of an input of photons, we'll have an output of ATP. And sometimes you'll see it on that side of the equation in brackets, sometimes you'll see plus energy over there, just like you might see light energy on this side of the equation if it were photosynthesis. And of course the products and reactants would be reversed in photosynthesis. Now you might be wondering and asking yourself, if this is a sugar molecule and you understand that complex carbs can be broken down into simple sugar molecules, how are protein and fat factored into this equation? And if you're asking that, I would say, first of all, that's a very keen observation. And the answer is simply that fats and protein can also be broken down into simple sugar molecules. And since the first stage in cellular respiration is the breaking down of sugar through glycolysis, fats and protein can simply skip this first step and enter the next step, which is the Krebs cycle. And the last step is the electron transport chain. So, there are three main stages in cellular respiration. Starts with the glycolysis, then you have the Krebs cycle, and last is the electron transport chain, which ends with ATP synthase, making ATP, because that's the whole purpose, right, to make this little energy molecule for the cell to use. I'm going to try to simplify this for you as much as possible, because I don't want you to get lost in all the terminology. That may sound daunting if you've never seen it before. To get the basic idea of what's happening here, there are only a few key terms that you need to focus on because you'll see them again and again and possibly on a test. I only bother to label the elements that are important or semi-important to get you to see the big picture. As I mentioned, the first stage of cellular respiration is glycolysis and it occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell. The second stage is the Krebs cycle which occurs in the matrix of the mitochondria. And the third stage is the electron transport chain, which involves a membrane and embedded proteins. And that membrane is the inner mitochondrial membrane, which is extensively folded for increased surface area. Remember, the mitochondria has an outer membrane and an inner membrane, and the matrix is all of this fluid within the inner membrane where the Krebs cycle occurs. Glycolysis is just the splitting of a glucose molecule, which is a six carbon molecule that gets split into two three carbon molecules called pyruvate. In the presence of oxygen, pyruvate enters the mitochondrial matrix and is oxidized to this two carbon compound that binds with coenzyme A to form acetyl CoA, which then enters the Krebs cycle, passing along these two carbons to oxaloacetate 
to form the six carbon molecule citrate. This cleaving of a carbon atom here is called pyruvate oxidation, or sometimes it's called the link reaction because it links the first reaction to the second reaction in cellular respiration. In eukaryotic cells, the link reaction occurs in the matrix, but for prokaryotes that undergo aerobic respiration, both the Krebs cycle and pyruvate oxidation take place in the cytoplasm because prokaryotes don't have mitochondria. The Krebs cycle is sometimes referred to as the citric acid cycle because that's the first product of the cycle. And it's also called the tricarboxylic acid cycle or TCA cycle because citric acid is a tricarboxylic acid. Sometimes you'll see citrate and sometimes you'll see citric acid. When it's an acid, it just signifies that it's dissolved in a solution so your ions are floating around in a liquid. Same as pyruvate and pyruvic acid. One is just solid form and one is liquid. It's the same compound, really. In the Krebs cycle, we lost two carbons as carbon dioxide here and here, so that we ended up with four carbons at the end again. And we also lost a carbon here during pyruvate oxidation. Each time we lose a carbon, we're exhaling it as carbon dioxide. The Krebs cycle produces NADH one, two, three times, and one FADH2 molecule per turn of the cycle, also one GTP, which is easily converted to an ATP, so it's considered an ATP equivalent. Remember, for each glucose molecule, we get two pyruvate, so this turns the Krebs cycle twice. So we would multiply all of these red energy molecules by two for each glucose molecule. Therefore, for each glucose, we make six NADHs, two FADH2s, and two ATPs. So for counting ATPs, I didn't really have room to show here, but glycolysis netted two ATPs. Four were produced, but two were used up, so that's a net of two ATPs made in glycolysis. And plus the two ATPs from the Krebs cycle gives us a total of four ATPs so far from the first two stages of cellular respiration. And if we're keeping track of NADHs, we have 3 times 2 is 6 from the Krebs cycle, plus an NADH was made for each pyruvate oxidation. So that's 2 plus 6 is 8, and 2 NADHs were made in glycolysis, making it 10. 10 NADHs and we only make just two FADH2s from the Krebs cycle. All of the NADHs and FADH2s we've made will go into the electron transport chain to be converted into more ATPs. What that translates into is from these 10 NADHs, we would get 30 ATPs coming out of the electron transport chain. And with these two FADHs, we would get four more ATPs coming out that makes 4 plus 30 plus 4 gives us 38 total ATPs after all is said and done from one glucose molecule. Keep in mind that this is only in the most efficient cell under the most ideal circumstance, so that 38 is kind of a theoretical number. In reality, that number is closer to 30. Now we'll zoom in on the mitochondrial inner membrane, the third and last stage of cellular respiration. The electron transport chain in the mitochondria has four complexes, coupled with ATP synthase. These complexes are responsible for creating this proton gradient that concentrates protons outside of the matrix. And ATP synthase is the enzyme that allows them to flow back in, producing ATP in the process. With the energy from the proton flow, for each NADH molecule, complex 1 and complex 3 will pump out 4 protons each, while complex 4 only pumps out 2 protons for each NADH molecule. Complex 2 is not a proton pump, but it is where FADH2 enters the electron transport chain, and because it skips complex 1, FADH2 pumps out less protons than NADH, 
it only pumps out six total, four here and two here, so it yields less energy than NADH. These complexes, one, two, three, and four, are all immobile. They're embedded in the membrane and don't move around like coenzyme Q and cytochrome C, which are mobile electron carriers. They all accept and transfer electrons along the electron transport chain. Cytochrome C transfers from complex 3 to complex 4, and coenzyme Q shuttles electrons from complex 1 to 3, or from complex 2 to 3. Notice the electrons don't travel from 1 to 2 to 3. It's either 1 to 3 or 2 to 3. Complex 1 accepts electrons from NADH, and complex 2 accepts electrons from FADH2, passes it along to coenzyme Q, which will transport it to complex 3. Complex 2, succinate dehydrogenase, is the only enzyme that's found both in the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, in the matrix and in the inner membrane. These two donated electrons will travel along the electron transport chain, reach another mobile electron carrier here, and then end up on oxygen. The electron transport chain in the mitochondria is the reason we breathe oxygen because oxygen is the final electron acceptor. It accepts the two electrons. And also, two protons to make water. Which is one of the end products of cellular respiration. It's oxygen's oxidative power that moves this entire electron transport chain along. That's why this is called oxidative phosphorylation. In biology, when we talk about oxidation, we usually mean gaining or losing a hydrogen or oxygen because electrons don't just float around by themselves in biological systems. Electrons are attached to a molecule or atom so when something gets reduced, often that means it's gained a hydrogen, which is like gaining an electron because hydrogen will allow whatever it's bonded to to hog its electron. Here, oxygen is reduced. It's gained the two electrons that were donated either here or here by NADH or FADH2. It's gained two protons as well, but oxygen gets to hog the electrons, so in effect it's being reduced. There are substances that can interfere with the function of the electron transport chain, and they're called inhibitors and uncouplers. Inhibitors are substances that can block any one of these complexes, including ATP synthase. Some antibiotics and insecticides are inhibitors. Carbon monoxide and cyanide are complex 4 inhibitors. Uncouplers are agents that uncouple the electron transport chain from the phosphorylation of ADP, meaning that uncouplers don't allow ATP synthase to operate because they destroy the proton gradient by making the entire inner membrane permeable to protons, allowing them to flow through so there is no more stored up energy outside of the matrix. It all dissipates and the proton gradient collapses. In ATP can no longer be made because there is no more flow of protons to fuel ATP synthase. You can imagine that doing this to such an essential, fundamental, biological mechanism 
could be a very dangerous thing, and it is. For example, some uncouplers are promoted as weight loss drugs because they make you burn and lose all this stored energy, right? But these drugs are also very lethal because they cause rapid heart rate, excessive sweating, and fatally high body temperatures. Suffice it to say, messing with cellular respiration is, is risky business. With that in mind, there are naturally occurring uncouplers that don't make the whole membrane permeable, but rather allow protons to pass through selective proton channels, which is to say that it's much more regulated and controlled homeostatically. And examples of natural uncouplers are found in brown adipose tissues, specialized fat cells, in hibernating animals and newborn babies for the purpose of generating heat. These brown fat cells oxidize their fat stores rapidly to produce more heat than ATP. Again, this is a highly controlled and regulated process, a very different case and mechanism from artificial uncouplers. And that's it for cellular respiration. I hope it was a clear explanation for you. You may want to review parts of this video, and that's quite all right. It took me a while to sort it all out, knowing what went in, what came out of each of the stages. That's what I would focus on. And also where in the cell each stage occurs. There's a written summary of all of that down below, which I hope helps you. And I'll see you next time.